Welcome. This is part three in our um, four part. It looks like it's going to be a four part uh, series in the formation of the biblical canon. Um, I'm joined today by Lee Martin McDonald. Uh, let me just give you his credentials here once again. He has a THM from Harvard, a PhD in New Testament studies from Edinburgh. He is the former professor of New Testament studies and the uh, president emeritus of Acadia Divinity School in Nova Scotia, Canada. He uh, was a visiting scholar and professor at Princeton. He's done uh, continuing research at Cambridge University and at Harvard. He's been a member of the Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas since 2005. And um, he is the past president of IBR, the Institute for Biblical Research. He has been author co-author or co-editor of many books on the matter of canon. In fact, um, I have uh, one of his earlier editions of the biblical canon, and um, this is a great book, over 500, almost five, five and a half hundred pages, um, and, um, but that has been updated, and now I think it's over a thousand pages. It's in two volumes offered by T&T Clark. You can get that on um, Amazon or any number of places. Um, great book. Lee, thank you so much for, for sharing about Canon and your expertise. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, let's just jump in. Today we're, we're talking about something that uh, interests me most. We've discussed the Old Testament Canon in our first video. In our second and previous one, we discussed the um, Old Testament Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha of both the Old and New Testament and what we mean by deuterocanonical. We talked about why some Bibles do not contain uh, that Old Testament Apocrypha. It's been some, an interesting journey, and we've learned that the process of canonicity was kind of fuzzy. Um, but now we're going to get into the area that uh, interests me the most, since my uh, uh, discipline is New Testament studies, and that's the New Testament canon. How did we mm -hmm. come to have the New Testament literature we have today? Um, how was it chosen? Who, who made the decisions? Is it, we'll, we'll talk about the Da Vinci Code a little bit later on, saying that Constantine and Council of Nicaea, did they choose what we have today and banished and burned the rest of them? You know, what's going on there? So, um, Lee, please talk about the process of canonicity for the New Testament. When did it begin and what happened in the years that followed? Well, thank you for that question. It's a very good uh, question. And I have, in most of my work, said the first canon of the early church was Jesus. Uh, who he was, what he did, what he said. And when those things were written down, some of which probably before he uh, died, uh, James Dunn, uh, Jimmy Dunn, has uh, written on Jesus Remembered, and he said, a number of the things that Jesus said were probably written down, and it, he calls that the Q material, uh, material found in Matthew and in Luke, but not found in uh, Mark or John. Uh, uh, so if Jesus said it, that settled the question. And that's why Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, said, he has a word from the Lord on this particular matter. So if Jesus said it, uh, you can't get any better authority than that. And of course, in Matthew, Jesus said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. In other words, uh, whenever Jesus said it, that was uh, a final authority. Eventually, when the Gospels were written, all after the death of Jesus, uh, though some of the traditions uh, certainly uh, are before the death of Jesus, as in perhaps the Q material uh, and the teachings of Jesus, uh, whatever that was written down and people quoted it, they never quoted it according to Matthew, Jesus said, it was always Jesus said, and that settled the question. Uh, Jesus said this, it might have been found in Luke's gospel or John's gospel, and sometimes, uh, fewer times, in Mark's gospel, but whenever Jesus said it, his words were like scripture. Mm 
And you find that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, which cites Matthew 10.10 10, and it's uh, Luke 10.7, uh, uh, and it speaks it uh, of it as Scripture. It's also citing Deuteronomy. So uh, anything that Jesus said was like Scripture, and you could see how the Gospels that were read in the churches uh, would be treated like Scripture because it's all about Jesus. The focus is about Jesus. Mm. Eventually, uh, after the death of uh, the apostles, what they wrote was considered to be uh, very important in the church. Most of the time, it's not called Scripture until the end of the second century. And so the earliest collection of Scriptures are really the Gospels, because they focus on Jesus. And the interpreter, the Apostle uh, Paul's, seven letters at least of Paul's are circulating in churches by the end of the first century, and they are beginning to be called Scripture in the second century and used like it. Um, you know, Clement of Rome in, in First Clement, no, I'm, yeah. no, 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 Polycarp, in his letter yeah. to the Church of Philippi, quotes from Ephesians and yeah. refers to it as part of the sacred Scriptures. Yeah, yeah, it, but... Uh, Polycarp, again, about 130, 140 uh, AD, uh, that's, uh, that's a second century development. Most of the time, uh, the writings of Paul and the Gospels are not called Scripture, though they're treated like Scripture before they're called Scripture. And I often share with folks that a text functions like Scripture as an authoritative writing that people should listen to and pay attention to and follow their life uh, and guidance uh, accordingly, then it's called Scripture, and then it's called Scripture before it's called canon, put into a fixed collection of books. Mm. So there were a number of uh, writings that were called Scripture uh, long before they were put into a complete list. Mm. And some of them were called Scripture and didn't make it to the final listing. Yeah, you've told me about this book. It was uh, came out in 2017, the Biblical yeah. Canon Lists from Early Christianity. So it's about these lists that you had just mentioned. Can you tell me, tell us about this list, these lists? Uh, well, the lists themselves uh, tell us what certain church fathers and church councils uh, thought were uh, uh, texts that could be read as scripture in the churches during their liturgies, their worship uh, time, but uh, and they made a list of those that could not. And uh, so those lists are very important. Uh, are they the only factor? And uh, the place where I disagree with one of the authors is he says the lists are uh, the sole property uh, or the sole uh, foundation for canon. And I said, well, actually, what you find in the manuscripts that have survived, the 5,500, uh, that lets us know also what functioned as Scripture, uh, even when it wasn't called that, or uh, maybe it was called that, a P72, a third, fourth century manuscript, uh, has, it's the first one that has uh, uh, first and second uh, Peter and Jude in it, and not in that order, it starts with Jude, hmm. but also it has eight other books in that same manuscript that are side by side, including uh, one portion of the uh, Psalms of Solomon, uh, the uh, uh, Odes of Solomon, different, uh, and some Psalms. Anyhow, uh, what the early churches read as scripture in the churches varied, and you'll see those variations both in the manuscripts that have survived as well as in the translations, and as well as uh, in uh, uh, the lectionaries that were used in the worship services. So I said, let's be careful. Most of the time, New Testament scholars don't look at the lectionaries that are put at the bottom of the pages in their Greek New Testament. Hmm. And, uh, I, and I should say, our Greek New Testaments today have 27 books in them. You will not find one manuscript in antiquity with uh, before the year 1000, that has 27 books and no others. Okay. That's a, that's not a irrelevant uh, uh, piece of information. And uh, sometimes they have fewer New Testament books, but also additional books besides. What, what did so, uh, Sinaiticus and um, Vaticanus have? 
How many well, did they have? Uh, yeah, Sinaiticus uh, had uh, uh, all of the New Testament books plus the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, Vaticanus uh, actually doesn't complete. Uh, it stops in the middle, uh, well, Hebrews chapter 9, it's, it's done. And then what you find in the uh, facsimiles that are made now, uh, those additions through the book of Revelation were made after 1400, oh. approximately 1400. So uh, they're both uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are uh, fragmented more so than uh, Codex Alexandrinus. Uh, which is much more complete. And it has additional books in the New Testament. First and Second Clement are certainly in uh, Codex Alexandrinus. And that, that's dated when? Uh, in the 5th century, okay. could be somewhere between 400, 450, and scholars date it uh, uh, in several places in there, but they all put at least the 5th century. And, and Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are both 4th uh, century, uh, right? 300 yeah. to yeah, I, part I of put, the 4th. Yeah, uh, some scholars put Sinaiticus first, and I put it second, uh, probably toward the last quarter of the 4th century, and Vaticanus probably 350 to uh, 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 375, somewhere in there. And I do that on the basis of some of the texts that have expanded in Sinaiticus that haven't expanded in Codex Vaticanus. Okay. What literature in the New Testament was always accepted, was never disputed? Yeah, the, the most uh, common books, and you see it in the fourth century, Eusebius uh, lists this in his, uh, his uh, ecclesiastical history. It's uh, uh, the third volume, uh, chapter 25, and uh, he mentions those that are homilegumina, those that are widely accepted by everybody. That was the four Gospels, he calls it the Holy Tetrad, uh, and he uh, uh, has questions about Hebrews, uh, but he has uh, 13 epistles of Paul, and uh, he has first uh, the book of Acts and first uh, Timothy, I'm sorry, uh, first Peter and first John. And uh, he raises questions about Hebrews, James, uh, Second uh, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Second and Third John, Jude, and Revelation. He has questions about those. Okay, that, that's Eusebius. But what literature in our New Testaments today were? Is, is there any literature in our New Testaments today that were never disputed? They were always accepted, whether you're looking at the lists or. You yeah. know, the compilations, the, the various canons. Yeah. yeah. Well, the earliest would be the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, that is cited far more times than the others uh, combined. Are all four uh, Gospels, were uh, any of them four, ever disputed? Uh, not after uh, not uh, after Irenaeus. At were about they disputed one, before Irenaeus? Uh, actually, there was some dispute uh, by Tertullian, uh, who's about 200 AD, and he's chiding uh, Marcion because he cited the Gospel of Luke and not an apostolic author, as in Matthew or John, uh, okay, so for his Gospel. Marcion, is there anyone other than Marcion that you know of who would dispute whether the Gospels should be in included in the canon, or the four oh, that we uh, have today? Uh, yes, and you cited him earlier, Serapion. Uh, when he first went to the church at Rosas, uh, Serapion said, well, go ahead and read the Gospel of Peter, if that's the only thing that's troubling you folks, and he hadn't read it yet. Uh, but 20 years after Irenaeus says, these four and no more, uh, there's a question that uh, Serapion says, ah, not a problem. Then he gets back home, and he reads it, and he says, hey, don't do that. That's, that's wrong. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but the four it, Gospels it you... that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, other yeah. than Marcion, did anyone ever dispute that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John should be part of the canon? Oh, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Uh, I think the Acts? questions, it, yeah, the questions were Mark and Luke, according to Tertullian. He didn't give them as much priority because they weren't written by an apostle. Okay. Uh, but from the th second, uh, the uh, early third century on, 
those four and no more, and there's no manuscript that I know of, and somebody could show me one, that has uh, a P45 is the oldest manuscript that has all four Gospels in it, and that dates about 200 AD. And from that point on, it's those four and no more, okay. to my knowledge. Uh, I'm about, open to uh, being corrected there, but I don't know of any. What about after Acts? That. Uh, Acts was uh, included in the uh, uh, P45, papyrus uh, number 45, that has all four Gospels and the book of Acts. Now, everything is fragmented in that. It's not in that great a condition, but we do have elements of each of those five books uh, in that. So as and far as you never know, Acts was there. never disputed? Uh, not, to, not to my knowledge, and it was always a part there, and it was attributed to Luke. Sure. Uh, right. What about so, Paul's uh, letters? Were the 13 letters attributed to Paul in our New Testament, were any of those ever disputed? Were all of them always accepted? Well, uh, in the earliest manuscript that we have, uh, Codex Sinaiticus and, and Papyrus earlier, uh, excuse me, Codex Vaticanus doesn't have them. Okay, the Codex that... Uh, is called P46, does not have them, and scholars have debated whether they could have, even with smaller print, gotten them in there, and and most agree, no, they wouldn't fit uh, in the collection of Paul's writings. And you do have questions about uh, Hebrews being attributed to Paul in Codex, uh, I'm sorry, in the councils at Carthage and Hippo before then, and then by the third council, which was, took place in 419, it just says 14 epistles of Paul. And that means Hebrews was attributed to Paul. So there was some question uh, about that and the pastoral epistles uh, that uh, uh, why is it not found where you would normally find it in Codex Vaticanus? Uh, I raised that question regularly. I said, I think there was some doubt as to whether Paul wrote it. But uh, church fathers, when they begin to cite it, generally cite it as Paul. Okay, so other than possibly the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, w which ones would do you, do you think may have been disputed by the early church? Uh, well, only the pastorals and Hebrews, oh, okay. uh, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't know that there was a question. I don't know of anybody that doubted that Paul wrote what is now called Ephesians. It may have been uh, Paul's letter that's mentioned in Colossians 4, 16, 17, uh, the his letter to the yeah, Laodiceans, and, uh, and Tertullian thought that's what Marcion meant, was the church of the Laodiceans uh, that uh, was by Paul, which would have been equivalent to our Ephesians text. And as you know, in the entrance, uh, the introduction to that in the Greek uh, and Ephesus is not there. It's later added uh, to that, which makes okay. uh, little sense because Paul knew the church at Ephesus, but he doesn't seem to know some of the people that he's writing to. If it was, I, I think it was an encyclical letter that Paul wrote. Uh, I I say I follow F. F. Bruce. Uh, Ephesians was the quintessence of Paulinism. Uh, so I, I consider it scripture, but I don't think it was initially written to the church at Ephesus. It may be that's where they found a copy of it, hmm. but it probably was uh, either written to the Laodiceans or somebody else. Gotcha. So of the, in our New Testaments, we have 13 letters attributed to Paul, possibly the, the well, the 14th Hebrews was attributed to Paul by much of the early church, not all. Um, but of, of the 13 that are attributed to Paul um, directly, because it, it, it claims authorship, only the pastorals were questioned by the early church, and then, of course, Hebrews. What yeah. about when it comes to, um, all right, how about James? Was that ever, how about the Catholic epistles, James, yeah. First Peter, Second sure. Peter, and Jude? Yeah, uh, well, James was questioned uh, by Eusebius in the fourth century, and uh, it is cited from time to time as James, the brother of Jesus, of course. And uh, 
I tend to follow that view. I think James may well have written it, though probably not on his own. It's excellent Greek. More, uh, uh, it, well, it's closer to Alexandrian Greek, like First Peter is, and uh, it could have been written by somebody like Apollos or whatever in the form that we have it. But uh, or he could have just it, used his amanuensis, his secretary could have just been. Uh, really... That's exactly right. And First Peter uh, or Second Peter speaks about an amanuensis, and Paul uses one. In Romans uh, 16, verse 22, Tertius. Mm -hmm. I used to ask that question. And who Cicero wrote the had Romans? his Tiro. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, I, all, all of those things are possible. All right, but uh, I'm, I'm not looking at uh, in this. I'm not looking for authorship. I'm just looking at what the what the uh, I'm interested in what the early church was thinking in terms of canon. So, of those Catholic epistles, James, First, Second Peter, Jude, First, Second, Third John. Yeah. Were any of those ever, you, you did say Eusebius question whether James should be in yeah. there. What about some of these others? Okay, uh, the Syrian Christians uh, uh, listed them as the uh, New Testament minor epistles, and that was Second Peter, uh, Second and Third John, Jude. Uh, those uh, four were were dismissed and not included in their earliest collections of New Testament writings. And uh, they even spoke against them because they don't think that they were written by those whose names are on them. And uh, so uh, that took several centuries before the uh, Syrian churches welcomed them. I think it's about the fifth or sixth century when they began to welcome them as scripture. And that was because of the Greek influence. They also rejected uh, the book of Revelation altogether. Okay. Uh, and that's the Oriental Orthodox uh, churches follow that tradition. And to this day, uh, they eventually welcomed Revelation and all of those books as scripture, but they're seldom found in their lectionaries. And the book of Revelation is never read in Eastern or Oriental Orthodox uh, worship, even though it's in their New Testament, which is uh, I just read a Greek uh, scholar who said, how can the book of Revelation be New Testament, uh, be in our New Testament, and we don't read it in our worship? Uh, so he raised that very question, but that's true. Uh, uh, whether it's Russian Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox or Oriental, they never uh, read it in their worship, though they, it took, uh, I think the earliest uh, a time is about the 7th or 8th century, I could be wrong on the dating, when they started to include it in their New Testament, 12th century for some of the Orthodox uh, churches. So, okay, so the four Gospels, Acts, yep. and 10 of Paul's letters were never questioned for the canon. By and large, I think that's correct. What about, and Hebrews, even though there was debate over whether Paul wrote it, um, yeah. Was that always included in the canon, or was it rejected by some because they didn't think Paul wrote it? Uh, not not always included. The churches in the West had serious doubts about it, but Augustine uh, eventually, and he was in charge, or uh, certainly present at the councils of uh, Hippo and Carthage, he accepted it, and by 419, uh, not long before he died, uh, it's called 14 Letters of Paul. Mm -hmm. But initially, in the first two councils, it's isolated. It says 13 letters of Paul, and then uh, one of the same to Hebrews, and that one of the same, I could give you the Latin text if you want, but the uh, one of the same doesn't say that Paul wrote it. But, but was it included in canon? It was included in the books to be read as scripture. And I think it was based on its content rather than its authorship. So would you say that Hebrews was always included in the canon, even when uh, it was thought that maybe Paul didn't write it? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far because okay. we don't have enough from the church fathers to say that all of them cited it. Okay, gotcha. uh, There's several books in the New Testament hardly ever cited by church fathers uh, until centuries later. And uh, so be careful about getting too much uh, in there. If it isn't cited, doesn't mean they didn't 
think it was scripture okay. because so many of the church father's writings are what we call ad hoc. They were dealing with specific situations and one text uh, say the gospel of John may not have fit that agenda that they're writing about. So they didn't quote it. That doesn't mean they rejected John's gospel. So if we were just looking but, at the lists, yeah, you could say that. Okay. Yeah. The, the lists themselves are uh, saying these are scriptures. Okay. And in that book that you, uh, from Gallagher and uh, Mead, uh, yes. And I just note the exceptions that they may have thought others were scriptures, but sometimes they were only dealing with specific incidences. Gotcha. All yeah. right, Lee, um, we're going to move all on here. Um, you know, it's often said that there are some specific criteria for canonicity. Did an apostle write it or one of their colleagues? Um, yeah. Does it contain orthodox teachings? Um, was it widely accepted? That, and some other criteria. Yeah. Um, are these criteria spelled out somewhere, or are they inferred <clears throat> from the literature that was accepted? Well, some of them are spelled out. If an apostle wrote it, and it was believed to have been written by an apostle, it's in. And the same thing with uh, widespread use. And the first uh, church father that uh, mentions this is uh, Origen. He went with widespread use. And uh, later, uh, uh, Eusebius, who had Origen's library, he says exactly the same thing. And that's where he has the homologumina, uh, widespread use. And that's his first criterion that he uses. And uh, you'll find that also in Origen in his uh, uh, on Christian doctrine and uh, also in the City of God uh, volumes. He says, uh, if uh, there's a text and you have a question, if nobody else cites this, then don't get to it. That's his point. If uh, everybody else is using it, maybe that's one you should read instead of one that isn't read by too many other people. So those two stood out. I put in uh, orthodoxy uh, as something that was broadly understood. If what uh, was taught in the earliest churches, the core traditions of Christianity, are not found in some of the literature, then it has to be excluded. Or if something is contrary to that, it has to be excluded. I include Second Peter because it core teachings are very much like the core teachings of early Christianity, though I don't think Peter wrote it. I think it's a second century document. Mm. But it does fit within that tradition, and if there were doubts, they always checked with the orthodoxy, and uh, that's why I've said there could have been no canon of Scripture before Nicaea. Nicaea uh, focused on the identity of Jesus. How do you have a Christian New Testament canon that doesn't have a clear concept of who Jesus was. So the writings that cohered with the, uh, the earliest teachings uh, about Jesus are the ones that were welcomed, and all of the canon lists begin to appear, almost all of them. There's a few exceptions. Uh, Irenaeus had four Gospels, those four and no more, and um, uh, uh, the uh, origin has some lists of the Jewish scriptures, but also some that he used, and he even used some of the deuterocanonical books as well. But they, they couldn't have come to a clear understanding of a Christian New Testament without some agreement on uh, who Jesus was. After that, then you start seeing canon lists and local canons. None of them are ecumenical, by the way. There's no ecumenical council that dealt with the biblical canon. Uh, it was always like the council at Laodicea, 360. Uh, there was one at Rome, 382. Uh, Carthage, uh, 393, 397, uh, uh, 419. Uh, there are several of those that begin to emerge, but they're all local. Uh, of the seven ecumenical councils, not one dealt with the scope of the scriptures. Hmm. And so, uh, now, well, that's interesting, you, because you had mentioned Nicaea, and I remember. Several yeah. years ago, you had a novel come out by Dan Brown called The Da Vinci Code. And then in mm -hmm. 2005, it, it became a movie. 
And I remember around that time, there was so much discussion going on and I ignored the, the book when it, and I remember a pastor bringing it up to me and said, hey, this is going to be dangerous. This is going to rock the faith of a lot of believers. And sure enough, it did. And it's like, well, I didn't want to read it, but I, I, I needed to because of that. Sure. And I went and saw the movie and it's like, wow, this is what's rocking the faith of believers. These are softballs that are being lobbed. These things are so easy to hit out of the park, what he's saying in here. And about Ni Nicaea, my understanding is, and it seems like you just confirmed this a moment ago, that none of the councils, uh, or Nicaea did not discuss canonicity. It was about the, yeah. who, the nature of Jesus. Was yeah. uh, They didn't even discuss which literature was to be included in the bible is that correct that's correct yeah so uh, you know he, even though the even though that book and the and the movie is long gone and probably not even discussed much anymore wow you know the things that it was claiming are you still hear these objections yeah. today council of nicaea and constantine determined which literature was going to be included in our bibles and the rest were yeah. banished and and burned you know it's one of these like nazi burning of the, of the books yeah well, if I could uh, just say, I, I initially just said to you, no, Nicaea didn't discuss it. There's one church father later who never attended that conference who said the book of Judith was uh, welcomed at, uh, uh, by those at the council. That may be true because it was always in, in Bibles there afterwards or collections of scripture. And in the prologue to Judith, Jerome makes a comment similar to that, but not exactly. And scholars have debated that forever, but they also know that he created canon lists, and you'll find that in that book uh, by Gallagher and and, uh, and Mead. Uh, he never includes uh, Judith in that list, so it's it's interesting that uh, uh, he rejected all of that. But he did find some value in reading Judith. That's the best that we can come to. But anybody that's, uh, and I've heard several times over the years before Dan Brown's book, well, uh, Nicaea settled the issue of canon. Mm. No, it didn't. And no ecumenical council, that means all the churches, East and West and representatives, uh, bishops, there were only about 300 that attended the uh, council of uh, uh, Nicaea. But they represented the whole church and the various areas uh, uh, where the church was planted uh, that uh, that uh, they decided to be open. The Council of Trullian uh, the, for the Eastern churches left it open where the local churches could decide whatever they wanted. And that's why you'll find a variety of books that are uh, cited and listed in uh, scriptures of the uh, uh, Orthodox churches, both Eastern, Russian, and uh, Oriental churches. It varies. Hmm. So all right, you said that the idea that Nicaea discussed the matter of the canon, where did, and, and that happened before the Da Vinci Code, where do you think that that idea originated? Well, I think it may have come from the tradition about Jerome that most biblical scholars, uh, well, church history scholars say uh, probably wasn't said by Jerome, uh, but by somebody else. But needless to say, we have all of the canons or rules or regulations that were uh, determined at Nicaea, and uh, a list of books is not in any of them. Wow. Okay. So, you know, often in discussions about canon, the question comes up, is the canon closed? Was it ever closed? Um, and being in the Protestant circles in which I run, you hear, yeah. oh yeah, the canon's been closed for a long time. But then we recognize, as, as we discussed in the previous video, <clears throat> yeah. that the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, <clears throat> excuse me, contain some other, and the Ethiopian Bible contains some literature that the Protestant Bible does not. So that would mean that the Protestants, if, if it's closed, the Protestants closed it at one point, the Catholics at another, the Orthodox at another, and they all disagreed. So, sure. Yeah. Um, what do you make of that? Is the canon okay. closed? If well, so, when? Uh, all right. Let me start with something. I'll, I'll make a biblical comment. There's not a verse in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that says these books and no others. 
And in the first couple of centuries uh, of the church, nobody else says that. And nobody is thinking about a closed biblical canon until much later, unless uh, the book that was uh, like the Gospel of Peter that uh, Serapion rejected, he didn't reject it because the canon was closed. He rejected it because of its theology that it was teaching. And it, he thought it was heresy and it should be rejected. Uh, it's only with Origen in the third century who begins to list books that he thinks are readable in the churches. He was very open with regard to the Old Testament, but not so much with the uh, the New. And those that's when the changes begin to take place, and nobody's talking about a fixed collection that everybody agrees to really until the end of the fourth century. And all of that is uh, after Nicaea. You had to have an identity of Jesus settled for most churches. It never was completely settled. The Arians continued for some time thereafter, and they're still around today. But uh, Jesus' identity had to be broadly accepted and when that was done, then they started making lists of books that cohered with the conclusions of Nicaea. And uh, that's why all of the books of the New Testament fit that, that model. I'm not ready. I have been accused of throwing out books of the Bible. I said, I'm not throwing any of them out. But I want to be informed by those and also by books that early Christians read wow. that didn't make it the Bible. Yeah. So... You wouldn't say the canon is necessarily closed then? Uh, I, I couldn't make a biblical argument for it being closed. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, uh, interestingly, and there's a book in the other room, uh, the Mormons wrote it, and they cited my book for saying the canon was open, mm. and that allowed them to have the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of the Covenants, and, and so on, and the Book of Mormon. And I've said... Uh, and they sent me emails on this, and I got six emails, <laughs> and I said, you have quoted me correctly, but uh, the criteria that were used, namely the orthodoxy and the time constraint and the apostolic community that produced them would not fit with what you had. Now, interestingly, they quoted all of the correspondences I had with them. They quoted me correctly. And it's in the book. And I, I wrote him back, and I appreciate it. We just disagree on that. Uh, the Apos uh, the uh, Orthodox churches uh, have just a larger collection of deuterocanonical books uh, beyond the uh, Hebrew Bible uh, in their Old Testament. And they haven't thought of adding new ones to that since. So historically, mm. it would be very difficult to add them. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Bovan's, uh, uh, Francois Bovan's comment on books uh, that warm the soul, uh, and that's not exactly the words, but that's the point. Uh, he saw that there was a lot of literature that warmed the soul of many early Christians and throughout church history. Uh, look at Saint uh, Francis of Assisi. Uh, I've heard his prayer uh, quoted so many times, it's almost like a scriptural thing. And uh, Mother Teresa, uh, Billy Graham, uh, in the circles I travel in, if Billy said it, it must be so. <laughs> and uh, and there are times when I've caught Billy when he didn't quote the text exactly right. Nope, or the something practice else. of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. That, yeah, that, that's absolutely. Been... And Henry Nouwen, I had classes with him at Harvard, and is a marvelous Christian. And I love his writings. He's, he's a wonderful servant of Christ and since gone home to be with the Lord, but I have no doubt. But wouldn't put scripture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we distinguish that, but we almost treat it like scripture. Uh, I remember the circles that I travel in, if Dr. J. Vernon McGee said it, it must be godly. And uh, uh, he's a radio preacher even to this day, but he died 30 years ago. And uh, his stuff is still being circulated and published and all, all of his books. And there's certain churches, if you should deny what McGee said, you'd be ostracized. So when I'm in those churches, and I go to them, any place that welcomes me to go and to preach, I will. I will not subscribe to any statements of faith. Uh, I, I said, I believe the Bible. 
and I believe the core essence of Christianity as it was passed on from the time of Jesus right uh, right on to the time of the writings. Mm. Uh, that's where I come from. But I don't like most of the statements and the people that write them generally aren't biblical scholars, they're theologians who haven't studied their Bibles very well and they don't <laughs> know anything about the manuscripts. So that's a personal bias along the way. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lee. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll wrap it up there right now, and uh, I'll, we'll have part four next. So and okay. been, so I still have a bunch of questions to, to uh, ask raise, you. What's please that? Please raise in your next section the Muratorian fragment, because that's the Achilles heel of a lot of New Testament canon studies. Oh, okay. Yep. Sounds there like you a go. plan. Okay. Thank you so much, Lee. You bet.